this is that, that it was this, this a strategic warning, and and we said that uh, the advancing of the uh, judiciary reform that was uh, the flagship of this uh, government and this uh, uh, it would bring it would bring uh, about an interior uh, crisis that in its the uh, uh, the economic and the uh, security uh, threats of Israel let uh, uh, we are warning that the continuation of this uh, process will harm the uh, spirit of uh, the IDF uh, and will harden the possibility of Israel to uh, to stand above uh, opposite its enemies and also it will uh, uh, threaten our stability economical and therefore we said we have to so stop and to focus and to for see the increasing uh, dangers. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, warnings are getting stronger and stronger again in our eyes. When we think of the all over uh, the uh, trends and the events that happened uh, lately, we see we see four vectors that uh, influence the uh, is, uh, security of Israel in my and and this justified to, to put the question. If there is here a change, strategic change, the first vector is the advancing of the uh, judiciary uh, 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 reform and the inner uh, crisis that is taking place. The second vector, the deterioration of the security that we have seen in the last months, that is characterized by this overtaking of uh, what we'll talk about it later. The third factor is, is the detente in the region and the fourth threat is the deterioration in the our uh, foreign uh, uh, relations of Israel. So let's go back to the 21st of March, a strategic warning of our uh, few days later on the 25th of March, the defense minister also Gallant is calling to stop the uh, judiciary uh, reform. It is a dramatic uh, announcement that is very, not often that it happens here, and he said we have to stop it because there are dangers, there are threats for the country. The day after the prime ministers, uh, he says saying that he's uh, firing the minister of defense, and and the uh, 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 strong sp spontaneous uh, manifestations that take place all over Israel, and the next day on the 27th of March, the uh, Hisad route is uh, calling out for a general strike, and this is also is not without prevalence before, never happened before. And the prime minister is top of the stopping of the uh, legis uh, legislation on the 8th, 28th of March. Uh, the Saudi uh, talks in the uh, house of the president a very, very troublesome uh, uh, week. But at the same time, something is taking place here in March and April, on the 13th of March, the this, the, outs, the unusual uh, in the Megiddo uh, attack on the 23rd of March, the Ramadan starts and there are warnings. And the 28th of March, a uh, uh, sabotage was uh, uh, stopped in uh, Greece, and uh, that uh, and there is we arrive at the Passover on the 5th of April, the evening of uh, Passover. This is the attack on the Temple Mount, on the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the next day uh, in uh, Eilat. At the shooting of uh, r rockets from Gaza, from Gaza, from Lebanon, and from south of uh, s uh, Lebanon, this is already an event that uh, of another uh, dimension. The same day, there's one attack in the uh, uh, in the Jordan Valley. Three women were called, and also on the promenade in Tel Aviv, people were hurt. This is very difficult to uh, digest, but that's what we said at that time. That is uh, what comes out, f there's another attack and more uh, missiles. That is warning everybody. There is the convergence of the uh, Palestinian uh, 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 convex and the Hezbollah, and we'll talk about it uh, more widely. At the same time, there is a detente. 
and uh, on the 10th of March, uh, the Saudi Arabia and Iran are uh, uh, renewing the relationships. And this event has two results, that the uh, renewing of the, uh, uh, of the relations on the 23rd of, of uh, March, Saudi Arabia is renewing the relationship with Syria, and the uh, the uh, people, the states of the region, it uh, doesn't finish there. There are uh, talks between Saudi Arabia and the Houthis, between Iran and Bahrain, and uh, this is something is happening which is outstanding, which is not really uh, characterizing our neighborhood. At the same time, there is deterioration of the foreign uh, relations. We can see it from different angles. But uh, there's one event that shows everything, and the um, President of the United States says no for the question whether he, the Prime Minister, will be invited to the White House uh, uh, in the uh, few, uh, near future. We had the excellent uh, relations. He just says no. This is like in brief, in one word, no, he just says no. But, but uh, despite of that, the Prime Minister uh, visited in four uh, capitals in Europe during uh, this uh, period. He visited in Paris, in Rome, in Berlin, in London. In each of these, uh, he is uh, received in well, under th th strong re criticism about the reform, and there are the manifestations, demonstrations wherever he arrives. I want to remind you that the day before yesterday, there were very uh, uh, strong uh, critic of the uh, nomination of the minister Mai Golan to be the consul of Israel in the United States, because this uh, subject that uh, uh, there's something that is outstanding in the uh, history of diplomatic relations with Israel, and the, the speaker of the State Department says that uh, that he, the United States is against the expressions of a minister uh, of Israel in that sort of thing, and and, and this says a lot. In the same time, there is a deterioration in the uh, economy, and again. The symbol of it uh, on the 15th of April, uh, uh, Modic, this is the uh, a, a one of the most important cre credit uh, uh, agencies, the first time that the provision of the grading of Israel is going down. It's a result of our own uh, acts. And uh, not only because of the COVID, but a lot of uh, countries have suffered because of the COVID, but uh, we were always, uh, we were more the tendency towards increasing tendency. Uh, how do we see a change in the strategy of Israel? The Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, spoke uh, lately the end of the limited uh, confrontation and the beginning of a new era, the security era, a real a threat at the same time. This is a very, uh, very uh, uh, troublesome warning. But I want to see over it that the main strategies of Israel in the last years is getting, uh, what were the main uh, uh, strategies that was, that were, we don't have this uh, control as much as possible, but also the defense of the walls all these years. And the uh, Abraham Accords, that was a way of to put aside the uh, uh, Palestinian conflict, that we had the agreements with uh, the countries in the uh, region that we will remain, we will go uh, around I Iran by a circle of uh, agreements with uh, regional uh, countries. And that was the main strategy and with the support of the United States while uh, the uh, United States is the dominant uh, power in the region. And all these uh, elements are deteriorating. The Abraham Accord, it was to put aside the Palestinian uh, uh, issue 
and the support of uh, the United States being the dominant power in the region. That, so that's the maybe not the situation, but the deterioration also of uh, few axiom, axi axioms that we took as, uh, as, uh, as evident. What are these things? We we are uh, reposing on the spirit of uh, the IDF, our strength as uh, uh, economics uh, uh, power, but we took it for granted for twenty last twenty years that the exterior the exterior the exterior situation gives over to what is happening inside. The, there is a severe uh, change in the external situation. We are together. This was the vectors. It was the uh, ideas that were behind everything so far. So to show you, I will show you the illustration that in uh, on Idiot Achonot in the uh, paper, a newspaper, Israel newspaper, on the page number six, there is a small uh, article by a uh, uh, journalist, the uh, Yossi Yoshua, who is the military correspondent. And next to it, on the seventh page, oh, there is something a crisis. Uh, uh, the picture that uh, what next? On the third of April, thirtieth of April, in uh, we uh, you uh, open the session, the summer session of the Knesset. Uh, I will say my opinion. I will say it in a way, the most uh, reliable way. We don't see in the horizon that a, a balance, a political balance will happen. I don't know what will happen. I think that uh, we don't have the ground stones, the main stone, that will be a balance, a political balance that Israel could go further in a normal way. What do we have? We have few foundations that are putting us in uh, turmoil. Is the the way the cabinet, the if, if Israel, it became very problematic of the government, and I'm saying it. And the cabinet didn't get together. The security cabinet, the uh, relationship with the between the government and the security entities. Are with uh, have n have never been like that, and the relationship between the government and the civil society is problematic. This is the situation we are facing, and therefore, the uh, conclusion is a very uh, troublesome uh, conclusion. I have a doubt that the Israel today has the capacity to have a security uh, strategy in face of the change of the situation, the security change, and this is actually the situation that we are facing right now. And that says also something, uh, how to act in a good way. I think that it's this way, that non-governmental non uh, uh, entities have to do the thinking, and it is very because of the uh, warnings and the 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 strategy and the uh, principles we had are changing. We shall not forget that this week, that what is going to happen this week, the day of remembrance of the uh, those who fell in the war. I think that each one of us that lives and live and have been in Israel understands that this craziness of the day of remembrance and the uh, this closeness of the and the independence uh, day together and it has a uh, content not less not more and the fact is that that today this uh, balance is uh, getting uh, very fragile. It's very difficult to see what will, it's very difficult to, uh, to I want to say about the Remembrance Day, that, that we have to remember to, and to save the civilians so far. That's what I have to say.
So hello to all the viewers and those of you who are here with us in the Institute. We are, this panel that we're about to open and discuss is dedicated to the security threats in the military security way of the systems we're coping with, especially we'll be paying attention to the conversions of the arenas and conversions of the threats. I will start with a bit of an anecdote. Uh, between the first Passover and the second Passover celebration, I was bombed with articles and papers. Uh, some of them were by people who has a PhD and others as well that were alarming that the conversion of alerts will lead to war that will be on the gate of the state of Israel and the Palestinian arena will be simmering from within and Hezbollah will be attacking us, coordinating from the north. Iranians will be sending drones from all the arenas and we will be saying something very significant. One of the explanations is that our enemies uh, see our weakness, a certain weakness, the way it's being actually indicated in our internal arena and will be abusing this opportunity. And this will be the pivotal moment of a significant change that is currently happening. Well, first of all, Manu just described here all of the occurrences, so I will not be spending too much time and save the time of the viewers and those of you who are present this particular introduction, but there's certain things that are happening in all of your arenas. I would like to remind you who we have here with us that are yet to mention Sima. She is the head of the research program of Iran and the Shia Crescent. Is it the resistance, the front? No, we'll call it soon. Honor researching the Northern Arena and Hezbollah in Udi who is in charge of the research of the Palestinian arena. So obviously we're here, we're pushing together the best of the best of the most important threats that Israel is currently facing. And I would like to open with one question to all of you. Uh, whether we are in the midst of the pivotal strategic change and turn of the convergence of arenas and threats that is connected directly to the judicial overhaul we're experiencing here, and obviously the undermining of the internal resilience of Israel, or is it just a coincidence? Just a local flaming up of various threats we experienced in the past already. It's not necessarily connected to what is happening within Israel. How do you analyze the current state of affairs the way we see it now? I will start with Udi and uh, then we'll move um, in this particular manner. Okay. How do you analyze the situation as we see it now? I will uh, start with uh, uh, Can you hear me? This subject of uh, it is a different arenas uh, parallel and, and that uh, for a long time this is not something new this is that wasn't born now. And uh, and therefore, why this is not a phenomenon that uh, this uh, phenomenon has different faces, uh, different uh, angles. The intensity this goes up and down according to the uh, general uh, strategic uh, pictures. We are in an era, in a time that the world is very focused on the war you know, in the Ukraine, in the United States, it is uh, focused and they pay less attention to the Middle East. I don't want to take the things, uh, the, the two, my two candles on the panel said that, but Iran is using this opportunity and states new rules in the region. Uh, they were said about the detente between uh, Saudi Arabia is leading that that this is uh, maybe a curtain that we can do new uh, tendency that that that, that uh, uh, or a, a parallel relationship we we used to talk about in the past we can do with Israel and with other we can do a normalization uh, and from all that is what added to it what is happening inside the uh, Israel what is happening in Israel is its influences on two parameters I remember that, that after the elections uh, I was in an event a big event that would took place in Abu Dhabi in the Emirates and I then a uh, representative from the uh, Arab countries that they said we are uh, happy with the results of the election that we like in Israel to think that this uh, stability and uh, from the, the uh, Netanyahu represents the strong uh, leader, and they realize that he is not, there's no stability and he is not a strong leader. That this whole idea uh, deteriorated immediately, and uh, 
and collapse. Then the second thing is that then we look at us, uh, uh, we do not interpret us in a good way, our enemies, and when they look at the uh, the uh, the uh, tension, the inside the tension, and the taking play uh, with the internal issues. This is a good as a occasion. Can we change the uh, can we change the rules of the games? Uh, to tell what happened so far? There is a weakness on the other side. Let's uh, let's uh, set new uh, rules that can save us. Uh, let's have new rules that will save us, uh, serve us in the future. That each one of them has it, trying to change the rules to check uh, uh, to what an extent Israel can Israel confront with all these events. And of course, when they, they, uh, because we are all the time. We say about that each uh, that the convergence of uh, arena so let's see what's happening on different areas. in my uh, opinion we uh, we say from every stage that we are uh, worried f they are challenged by the, the different uh, uh, arenas in my opinion the main uh, issue is that that I know that you we don't agree on that is Iran. Iran is using this uh, situation and, uh, to try to make uh, new rules on the one hand, and the other hand, uh, a lot of mistakes that we are doing. So, General Adurgo is Udi on this matter. The difference of uh, arenas is not necessarily. We wrote a memo on that the war will come as war in a few different fronts. This is no news, even the IDF is ready for that. What actually happened right now is that we do see more audacity, uh, as Udi just described right now, a little bit of uh, an attempt to benefit from the opportunity, what seems to them as is really weakness, and to do things they never dared to do before. I want to be, from the other hand, on the more optimistic end uh, of the scale. Mano presented here the severity of the strategic situation and the strategic plan. I would look to be on the optimistic side and to see a few directions that maybe have a different opportunities and not necessarily just threats. The first of all is that the strength of the IDF is preserved and been proven during the last round as well. It's possibly we can talk about... Uh, the political rank that was more limited and restricted and less uh, audacious, but the power of the IDF is there and an ability to handle and cope with few arenas at the same time is actually being constructed and built right now and it exists already. By the very definition, the weakness that is perceived is not necessarily in the security context. An additional matter I would like to bring up is more in the direction of what we see right now is the internal developments in Israel. Look. This is actually reversible. We are within this process right now. We have this feeling that it's an endless process with no end in the end of the tunnel. But it's reversible. It's obviously in our hands, in the hands of the political rank mostly, to stop where they stop and start an actual dialogue or not. But this is reversible and it's in our hands and uh, we can definitely change this matter. And the third aspect I would like to bring up, it's possible that from all of those horrible developments, in the end of the day, something good will grow because um, very many different topics that we definitely kept under the rug, uh, relationship between the government and uh, the judiciary system, and the whole topic of internal disagreements and etc. the internal rifts. It's possible that now when they are exposed in the open and are being discussed and talked through, maybe we'll move forward and find solutions that, that will allow us to move forward. I try to create an optimistic overview. I hope I manage to do so. Yeah, we are. I just would like to tell you and the viewers, we have the whole panel that will be focusing on the changes within Israeli society and uh, 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 judiciary overhaul. We are focused on the security risks and threats and etc. Same again, a general overview and we'll be zooming in into details. I think differently from Orna that we are currently given at the point of a certain conversion of the security processes that have a negative potential for Israel. Uh, as it happens very often, uh, we talk about various stars that align, not all of it because of us, some of us completely unconnected to us, but they did align somehow and you cannot ignore that. Obviously, and I completely agree with Udi, that Iran is in fact indeed... Um, 
the main security threat of Israel, our challenge, I would say. But what has happened today is a convergence among all of those aspects. There is a connection between the progress in the nuclear plan and there is a connection to the encroachment of Iran on the global regional arena. So this encroachment is one among other components of this resistance front that Iran tries to create for quite a while, whether it's Hezbollah, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad in Gaza Strip, or the militias, Iranian militias in Syria, in Iraq, and Houthis in Yemen. And the event that happened on the Temple Mount, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on in detail, that connected the dots really, in fact, even there were no missiles sh launched from all of those uh, geolocations, they all expressed their opinions, all the leaders of militias in Iraq, obviously Hezbollah, and the uh, launch of uh, the barrage of Hezbollah from Lebanon. At uh, this arena, this connection of arenas that Iran been talking uh, for so many years was connected, not all of them through missiles, obviously, and obviously the relationship between uh, Iran and China and Russia. This is a strategic development on international level. We never saw that before. Uh, Russia is in need of aid of Iran in military field, and Iran, Russia, and China are together implementing different steps of um, not maritime drills, uh, the conversations about that the Chinese will sell uh, things to Iranians and then transfer to Russia. So in fact, we are in a completely different international situation that existed before, of course, when those countries, Russia and China, voted in the Security Council against Iran and for the sanctions. Obviously, an additional process that is happening is the return of Syria into the arena and the developing relationship between Iran and the Saudis, Bahrain, uh, Jordan and Egypt very soon. Israel can continue and uh, say that they are processes, of course, and they are processes, obviously. But there's a certain point in time where those things are converging into one. And the question whether Israel will succeed, of course, we will never mention what has happened on the other side. The undermined relationship between Jordan and Israel, the undermined relationship between the Emirates and Israel, the distancing of the chances of Saudis in Israel and the certain cooling down of the relationship with the United States, all of those processes are together very negative processes. It will take you time, if even at all, to amend those processes. Even the change will happen. And as I say, it could have happened that it will happen without some kind of internal aspects, but it's happening now when things are happening inside Israel as well. And I think we're at a very negative point of time from the national security perspective. I would like to throw in um, just a factual foundation that is very clearly understood that conversions of geographic arenas happened, um, obviously, very clearly. Uh, and proven as a result what happened in the Palestinian arena, which was echoed on the Temple Mount, and what came up um, from Gaza, later on the Palestinians in Lebanon, and later on Palestinians in uh, Syria and Golan Heights. Obviously, there is here a certain uh, a trial, an experiment, I would say, in certain how will it look, this uh, convergence of geographic arenas. In each of those geographic arenas, Iran is present. So from Iranian perspective, seeing how, in fact, the Palestinian system is converging geographical arenas where they are present, the Palestinians, this is quite a dangerous thing for Iranians, where the learning might be uh, quite challenging for them in the future. I would like now to get into each of those arenas separately. I'm going to start with you, Seema. We'll start with a provocative question. No, Iran, and a provocative question. Iran, we'll start with Iran. Iran has central challenges, a threat on the nuclear program. They might reach the nuclear bomb level and the expansion and encroachment of various malicious networks with strategic capabilities. And we constantly talk about that. We emphasize the threat. They are, let's challenge that. Maybe it's not a challenge. Maybe we're just trying to horrify our public. The nuclear program of Iran is possibly, according to what the CIA had, Burns said, they did not decide yet to go towards the nuclear bomb. They're playing on the lines a little bit, uh, raising up the heat, and that it's very possible there is a halacha verdict of the leader that prohibits them from actually reaching the nuclear threshold. And the local programs, well, regional programs, besides Hezbollah, will be discussing, well, not a big, actually, threat, operational threat, and how the Minister of uh, Defense said we attacked uh, twofold at the same period of time in the last year, and we are probably operating in a significant manner. 
So now there are different publications that Iran opened an additional front on the Red Sea. But again, maybe we are just trying to scare the public. It's just maybe not that serious. Is it possible? Well, look, for you know, me for many years, I'm usually not a um, mystical approach. I don't think we're pushing it too far. I think it is an event that happened here and it's happening right now in our region. And we have to understand that it's not happening in the vacuum. Israel operates against Iran, as the Minister of Defense said, and he obviously he glorified the fact that during his uh, term they are more active in Syria during the last few months. Uh, indeed, there is a lot of activity in Syria and two guard guardians of the revolution were killed as a result of this operation. The Iranians will not be sitting on the lines forever without responding. It's true, Israel has been very aggressive in Iran and in Syria and definitely managed to cause damage to significant assets and Iran has the toolbox that is not necessarily full with very effective tools, but run working as well. And they try again, as I said, only two days ago, it has been published by the Shin Bad, that people who are arrested in Judea and Samaria, Palestinians that Hezbollah recruited for the sake of the operations in the field. We're familiar with the Megiddo event that happened from nowhere. In fact, it took us a while to start to decipher and to issue the information to the Israel public, but it came from Lebanon. It came under the protectorate of Hezbollah into the state of Israel, 70 kilometers from the border. It happened. Randomly, only one person was hurt. Uh, God forbid there would have been a bus full of soldiers that, that would have been killed. We would have now fighting a war with Hezbollah, probably. So what I'm trying to say is we need to take into account that there is a connection of different, very destructive aspects that never existed at this particular level of strength and open uh, account with Iran and Israel and the feeling that Israel is weaker and the willingness of the Palestinians, especially of the Hamas, to actually increase and accelerate the activity to try to receive the support of the front. And as well, this is a question mark I'm putting here, uh, whether the dialogue between Saudis and the Iran and Houthis in Yemen that continues the ceasefire for now, does it actually allow the Houthis to operate against Israel? And they did threaten to do that. The maritime routes of Israel, significant part of our uh, commerce is going through that particular area. One can definitely try to push it into the corner and say that we exaggerate, but I think this time we do not exaggerate, actually. There is a convergence. There is a definitely an open score, and there is a distress within Israel. And the external factors identify that and think it's possible they're mistaken, but they do think that one can actually try to challenge Israel right now. Oh. There, there was the uh, Begito event that had a light, uh, that, but the potential would have been uh, stronger. Could have ended in a war from the north. And uh, we also see from the reports of the UN this increase of the uh, the open activities of the Hezbollah with the document, and they don't hide uh, anymore. And they also threaten. They connect this the uh, deterioration, but it's clear that uh, in Australia it goes on the threshold. There is something in the, the security that is uh, nobody, it, is it really Megiddo? It is an event, is a rocket, it's the same uh, event. And the second thing is, it is going in the direction of a war, it's a deterioration, are we, the IDF, what can we do with it? So, well, that's true that two very extraordinary events, because we used for a decade, and actually more than a decade, there was quite relative uh, quiet on the Lebanese border. And there is reincarnation of a terrorist attack from the field of uh, Lebanon into Israel. Only one person was wounded, though, but it succeeded. And another matter is actually the barrage of missiles from uh, the southern Lebanon at a such a significant scope of 34 missiles that were launched on Israel. Majority of them went intercepted, but the audacity of actually doing such a thing, obviously we don't want to continue to live under such a reality and going back to the reality where we are being constantly shot at from the north, very extraordinary events. Whether there is a connection between two, of course, if you look into the connective uh, affinity between two is the cooperation between what we usually call today the axis of resistance, which is the Shia axis, we're well familiar with, this proxies of Iran and Iran, plus the Palestinian component of the various uh, resisting agents, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. All of those together 
create here the same joint thread. They have a joint headquarters. They work together. They have a war room together and they plan together. And regardless, I still want to say that two of those events, they have certain internal logic that is quite different. The first event that was in the middle of March was on the um, uh, background of what uh, Sima described as the signals of frustration of Iranians of disability to respond to Israeli operations. And Hezbollah tried to do something in this particular context of frustration. This is one event. And another event was very well connected to the Temple Mount events. Uh, yeah, so this way or another, that's... Um, it's actually the... He is walking the very thin line. Yes, he's walking the very thin line. Um, reading the weakness of Israeli system and uh, extra audacity and willing to take more risks. That's true. There is an increase of the self-confidence of Nasrallah. We can see that in his uh, speeches and addresses and his actions as well now, what you actually presented um, recently at the borderline of Lebanon. And it's true. They are different components. They're different components. And the end of the day of acceleration, of there is definitely... Miscalculation, deterioration, this is a risk as we described that and very true. The more friction we experience, the more chances of some kind of threat that happens. Well, we did not respond to Hezbollah. Do you think we missed an opportunity? Well, look, I'm not really sure that any reaction to Hezbollah at this particular timing one should have responded in any significant manner to Hezbollah or more significant manner versus Hezbollah. I actually think that from Israel perspective, it's important to look at it as an open score with Hezbollah because there is deterioration in deterrence and we need to operate in order to re-establish the deterrence with Hezbollah. I would like to say something else, that there is something, another component, we call it the misleading or actually false uh, confidence. I think they also were, um, and they do show significant confidence towards the, uh, the external aspects. Israel is weak, Israel will not complete its um, 80th years of existence, but from the other hand, he's also very restricted, he's hiding behind the Palestinian factors, he wouldn't, he didn't admit he lives in some kind of uh, space of bit of ambiguousness and denial, he did not admit that Hezbollah was behind any of the activities of any sort, and he actually said that I would rather keep it quiet, so there is still some kind of element of restriction, I would say, oh fine, so Udi. Um, the Palestinian arena, let's come to you. Uh, we do talk about that for quite a while. Two main threats in the Palestinian arena. One of them is a long-term uh, threat of um, lack of any strategy in the Palestinian um, arena of separation. We are actually spilling into one state solution that we describe as a complex and problematic solution, in fact. And the second aspect is the continuum, a whole continuum of different events that... Uh, might bring to a very violent eruption in the short term, and we also mentioned that. So there is a violence and there is a very short-term change and the long-term. To what extent the policy of the State of Israel and the judiciary overhaul impact both of those processes, to your opinion? Can you hear me? The first thing is to say that, uh, to continue what the owner said, do we have to make clear this point? Also, Gispaba and also Iran, they don't want to war with Israel. If the, each of them had a, prox a proxy, the main idea is to challenge Israel, uh, on to challenge it on its borders, so Israel will not be uh, r uh, be free for other issues like the uh, nuclear issue in Iran. And therefore, uh, to, uh, the way is to threaten Israel on its border. That all the proxies, including the Palestinian plan and the Palestinians, that the easiest one to uh, operate, Hamas, uh, and uh, the Iranians do influence uh, directly on this uh, access with their uh, training, with their uh, material, with the weapons. Everybody was waiting that uh, that the uh, uh, that the Al Aqsa uh, crisis would take place. They were all waiting to create what would be, and this event took place. And everybody was waiting for that event. Everybody is uh, ready to, uh, to to support and act against Israel. And we have to remember this issue. The second thing is that I think it's happening something strange. The government of Israel it gives uh, the actually the hospitality to Hamas. Doesn't touch uh, uh, Hamas because it's getting stronger in Lebanon. 
the uh, and we don't touch it because it's under the umbrella uh, security umbrella of the his Hezbollah and and the uh, of the uh, uh, and the uh, uh, and so a recovery of of uh, a Gaza Strip. So Gaza Hamas is feeling very good. So all these events uh, on the te Temple Mount that didn't succeed to do a large intifada. He wanted to bring a large intifada and couldn't do it. There were some uh, serious uh, attacks, but uh, the but his uh, success is not very good. But the, uh, they had Israel is uh, cooperating with it, give it, give it uh, immunity in Lebanon and in Gaza. It helps to Hamas to make the uh, Palestinian uh, Authority relevant, to bring to the end the, of the uh, uh, Palestinian Authority. This is the strategic warning that the present uh, government of Israel will not say it on a stage openly. This to the this tr the, tr the present government believes that the that we can uh, control the uh, o uh, the occupied o o o territories. It will be cantons, and with that we will solve the Palestinian problem. This is the pro uh, works we're doing here, and the uh, it is we understand it creates a very big problem that everything will explode, and we we'll bring it into our home because instead of bring taking it out, we we'll bring it out in. And that we don't see, we don't talk about it. So what happens with the protests? Uh, there is a very strong uh, connection between keeping democracy and the way we refer to the revolt. We don't want to connect between the two events that because more and more people will come that their positions are more to the right wing. What refers to the Palestinian issue. So if we all take down, we put away the uh, Palestinian problem, we think that we can put it in the corner, it would be irrelevant. But it will uh, explode now in a small uh, range, but it will explode in the future on a larger uh, range. So in the chaos on the government, they can do the main, the next uh, mistake on the Temple Mount, and again all these things will burst out. Thank you. I want to sum up with short uh, sentences. First of all, also if the thing is not right for uh, factual, the the visions of the future, the, the forecast in the, in the in the Middle East are very important, and the strong uh, strongness of the uh, civil society and the uh, hurting the uh, systems of the IDF, it is uh, it has influence and may change the whole uh, balance of powers in the region. It doesn't change the fact that uh, it is their retaliation uh, balance can be changed. On the other hand, they have, uh, Iran and the Palestinian arena are in front of a, a large uh, change at, and that the increasing because of the inner situation in Iran, uh, the decision, strategic decision to address China and Russia and not to the, the to the cabinet of the USA. And as it, it takes it away, the uh, uh, nuclear accord. And what you told is the other thing is the, the perception of the uh, Iran of a good neighborhood and to uh, uh, to make better this, uh, relationship with the neighboring country. Because also the other neighbors are uh, afraid of the uh, is, uh, American retreat from the region. And the, uh, the deterioration, uh, the Palestinian story is deteriorating for the per perception of the Iranians. It is a problem. So, so maybe we're in convergence of uh, arenas, but the uh, geographical potential is understood. And this connection, I only want to say uh, to emphasize one thing that Uri said that. Uh, uh, intent, the intent, intended uh, uh, weakening of the Palestinian uh, Authority will have uh, security and legal uh, uh, influences on the status of Israel. It will be violent and, and we will have to confront it in the region. I would like to thank you for your contribution. 
and I invite the next panel. afternoon. So this panel again will try to air up a little bit. Um, the discussion will not talk about the uh, hard power of military and security, we'll talk about the softer diplomatic aspects. Let's talk about the relationship between Israel and the United States and the fascinating dynamics in my eyes that is happening now in the Middle East. Look, today this has been quite a while we hear about the weakening of the American role in the mi Middle East, about the continuous withdrawal of American forces from the Middle East. And it seems when the attention in Washington has been um, actually turned to more challenging arenas as far as they see Ukraine and Russia, China and uh, Taiwan, the Middle East is actually losing the priority. And um, while well, distancing themselves from the area, it seems that there is a bit of a concern with the distancing or maybe even a rift has been opening up between the United States and America in the light of the current government, on um, the background of the judiciary overhaul and the policies towards the Palestinians. I would like to mention, and Manu mentioned that as well, this is the development that the Institute pointed out as part of the strategic warnings we published a month ago. And if I would like to echo the previous panel, the topic of our panel today is dedicated to an issue that Hassan Nasrallah chose in order to open his famous uh, address on Jerusalem Day in the end of the last round of the escalation in the beginning of his address, Nasrallah focused on the positive developments of the global arena when he wanted to emphasize and highlight the weakening of the American force. Uh, he described how the American diplomacy failed in different arenas, Venezuela, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, and he explained that, that it created an actual lack of trust and um in the Middle East, you cannot trust the American role any longer. And this is how he describes the challenge of normalization that we'll be talking about in the air. He didn't settle down only for those words, but he said the American weakness, in fact, created a reality of multipolar reality. And the United States does not provide Israel with everything that Israel needs, and it will continue to deteriorate Israeli deterrence. We always take Nasrallah with certain, I would say, limited attention, but uh, through our distinguished panel members, let's try to understand what is happening around us. Let's start with the relationship with America. So that, as I said, the government doesn't even hide their concern, the administration doesn't hide their concern with the process that the Israeli government is leading based on the judiciary overall and unilateral steps with Palestinians. We discussed extraordinary expression of the American president, including the famous phone call with the prime minister that does uh, reflect, I'm sorry, having a certain technical uh, disconnect, just a second. The uh, administration uh, is in favor of Israel, is engaged for the security of Israel. On the other hand, the, uh, as you said, the statement of uh, Emmanuel, as he said before, this is a statement of Biden that he is not, in this point, intends to invite the Prime Minister of Israel to the United States. I think that this statement, it, above all, it uh, expresses a very strong uh, crisis in our uh, relationship between the two leaders because the message of Biden is very clear. The, uh, the, uh, the, the administration wants to see actions. And not uh, when this government has uh, entered into term, the Americans have hoped and they even believed there is a that he will avoid to go uh, again with the extremists and to get too problematic. And there are two issues that are bothering the uh, uh, administration. It's one is the uh, uh, behavior and the uh, Palestinian arena. The 
the idea of the two uh, state solution is in danger is what they think which is right for the Palestinian arena and also for the deterioration in the air uh, in the region which the Americans are afraid of the second thing is the legal uh, decisions that the uh, administration is not entering into the issue what is important for the uh, administration is that that the uh, Israeli system will be an agreement between all the uh, political uh, vectors and entities and it will not uh, be a threat to the balance between the different uh, governance and that Israel will maybe become an undemocratic country like in Hungary and Poland and we had the relationship uh, uh, between Israel and the US uh, have uh, gone through crisis uh, in the recent years the famous crisis during the term of uh, Obama, the uh, signing of the uh, nuclear agreement. But one has to say about the characteristic, uh, the characteristics of the the way in the past the crisis between the U.S. The, there were uh, political uh, uh, discussion, but now we're talking about thinking about a crisis from the point of view of the American that the steps that are taking place are on the verge of a, of a kind of a change of the nature of the democratic change of Israel. That the relationship between Israel and the US is uh, uh, based on uh, equal uh, values. We have shared values and the changing of the nature of Israel in that the uh, American vision is uh, weakening the, abil the ability of America to justify Israel if it's not a democratic country. It is also hurts the relationship between the two countries. Um, we can also see that this is all the background, the change uh, that take place in America. We don't have time to uh, talk about it, but those changes taking place in America, only a few of them show that two phenomena which are problematic in America. There is a big gap between the Democrats and the Republicans and the, their support of Israel. More Democrats are then that fight with the Palestinians and not with Israel. And more a serious one, there is a change between the young people in America. The young people less uh, the support Israel. There was a, 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 a review made and that they found out that there is problematic. I think that we have to see the things that the Biden and what they say about Israel regarding the relationship with Israel. I have heard a lot of speculation that uh, like uh, Israel is, the uh, U.S. is less important for Israel we don't say that Israel has not come to into a discussion with Israel into a dispute of them. But it also insists on, in, on its uh, principle, but it has to take into account and to understand that the walking against the American is uh, actually going against its own interests. Not to if this is a crisis that killed that the relationship between the United States and Israel have a certain context. This is probably influenced by the global phenomenon. How would you analyze the geo? political global reality right now. I mentioned Israel, they talk about the whole multipolar world. Do we identify competition between superpowers that is increasing? Is it connected to internal processes in Israel or not everything is actually focused on us? And what are the ramifications of this particular regrouping of our strategic situation? We did look at the really wrong time to bring to discussion the topic of joint values with the United States. Since the United States is currently given uh, at war, a global war on values, uh, which is focusing on which is the most dominant and successful form of uh, ruling of liberal Western democracy or the challenging alternatives from the East, such as Russian and Chinese option. And when the United States is escalating this battle, this is probably less tolerant 
towards uh, various aspects that he can be heard from outside is something that infringes liberal democracy. United States, I would like to calm down people here. They understand absolutely nothing about the judges uh, selection committee or the judicial overhaul. They're not focused on those details. They understand one thing, power. And they know one thing, the power has to be balanced by a counterpower. And this is the only thing they care for when they look at the current situation. But this is a concentration on restricted power, concentrated in one hand. They will not be drilling into details. They will say, okay, this will infringe the liberal democracy tapestry the way we understand it. And uh, this is exactly what can be complicated in this field. Uh, when you ask from one hand, how will it impact? I would like to say that those who expect to see a crisis between ourselves and the United States by a uh, I don't know, uh, various kinetic activities against Israel, or someone will decide, okay, I will not give you ma ma military aid. This is not how will it look like. It will be very different. The depth of the support will become shallower. It, the interest, it will be just interest and no values beneath. It will be just leadership and no society behind it, no public behind it. What is, makes us very special in our connections with the United States is not the upper layer of interests and the leadership. This is actually the in-depth layers of the connection that are projection of the real power of ours towards the area. Because the United States will continue to preserve relationship with anyone they have interests with and have interests to preserve with us, but it will not deter our enemies because interests change at one night. What deters our enemies is the depth of the connection and that is something we deteriorate right now and at the current era it's very problematic. It also impacts the region. Of course, we'll talk about that when we're talking about the regrouping in the region. So, yeah, um, I would like to get back to the Abraham Accords period. It seems that Israel is actually riding into the sunset. We can actually brush off the Palestinian issue. It's not a barrier any longer for appeasement or arrangements with the Arabic countries around us. And now we do see certain stagnation or at least a little bit of uh, I was a lack of progress versus other countries with which we normalized our relationship. We saw through the last escalation round how we are being completely um, disregarded by the countries such as the Emirates and Turkey that they're renegating our approach. And how would you assess the situation, the status of Israel in the area? Are we looking at what is happening here, internal crisis we experience, to what extent it impacts the way they do perceive us? Of course that the uh, region is looking what's happening here. If we are part with uh, fear, part of them, and some of them with the joy. Because of the inner uh, situation, uh, crisis, we, uh, they, we show uh, uh, weakness. It has two uh, ramifications. The f one ramification is is the enemies of Israel, like it was discussed in the previous panel. The oil enemies of Israel are trying to... The second verification, uh, which I wanted to uh, concentrate, that even the those who sit on the, uh, on the fence, are, uh, they perceive Israel under this weakness, I think that this phenomenon is already taking place. The first thing is that the uh, normalization accords, the new ones, are under uh, proof because it's of its uh, actions. It, it sometimes it's more damaging. We hear the testimonies of uh, leader people, the normalization especially for the Emirates and the Bahrain, they have interest to uh, strengthen their relationship with Israel. But this be disconnected from the uh, Palestinian uh, arena. All Israel was uh, is uh, silencing and is balancing the situation and the deterioration of the Palestinian arena and the uh, expressions of uh, Israeli ministers. I will give examples uh, of it by force. 
they have to uh, refer more to the Palestinian issue. It is challenges the existing uh, courts with the Arabic countries. The one example, the Emirates, it is negative. We taken the countries are sitting on the fence. The prime minister was uh, said that one target. I do uh, peace with the Saudis, Saudis, but that didn't happen. Disconnected. The broadcast is disconnected. I don't remember such a thing. Many uh, the about the activities of the government, it is uh, unprecedented. It is uh, to look again at Israel uh, and also the uh, uh, change in the relationship between the Israel and the US. This is also an element they're looking at. So I would like to move from the outlook on Israel to more expanded tendencies that we see today, the trends in the region. It's quite an amazing event, really, after a decade that followed the Arab Spring of conflicts, riots and disputes. It's a detente in the Middle East, the end of history. Appeasement, processes of normalization between various countries that usually do not get along. Just a second, another technical difficulty we experienced with the Internet. We never thought that those events will actually happen. And I would like to try to understand what is behind those uh, occurrences from your perspective. Let's start with the superpower overview. Uh, that, uh, the American role in the Middle East, whether the Americans are withdrawing from the Middle East, from the region in general, it's just a matter of time until we'll see that they are actually withdrawing not just from Afghanistan, but also from Iraq, maybe from the Syrian arena as well. Do you see such an intent in the administration? Well, I think that um, when you look at the America, first of all, it's mostly the issue of priorities, in fact. Only a few months ago, the American administration published a strategic national security document, and the Middle East uh, receives their very sh relatively short chapter that is very far from the top priorities of the United States. Well, obviously, China and Russia are heading and there are other um, issues until they actually get to the Middle East. I think that the very common approach today in Washington is that the region uh, presents uh, more problems than opportunities and the Americans, the way they are, work based on their interests. Of course, it doesn't mean that the United States is leaving the Middle East. The United States is operating the Middle East in a different manner than they did in the past. In the past, almost... A default was, in fact, um, each event the Americans were implementing power, force, or working with force. This is not happening any longer. Americans, in fact, build their strategy, and they call it uh, alliances, a deterrence, a diplomacy for in order to prevent escalation. Biden's advisor um, just uh, two months ago presented the um, strategy of the administration in the Middle East and defined it as a Biden doctrine, though I think it's not necessarily Biden doctrine, it's more of the recent president's doctrine. And uh, the policy of current administration continues, even Trump's uh, period, and obviously it started um, earlier during Obama's administration. And this advisor defined, in fact, five different fields that are the foundations of American policy in the Middle East, and he stated the following. Uh, what guides the Americans are alliances, unions, alliances, deterrence, diplomacy, integration, and values. Those are the foundations, and it also specifies what exactly it includes. It's usually to pay attention to two fields. First of all, the principle of alliances. The period of uh, 
Americans operating for the benefit of the interests of other countries is over in the Middle East without them contributing to the American interests in any form. Americans understand as well that they're paying a price as well as you all just explained to us and they absorb this price. They're a superpower. Of course, they have other interests and they work based on those interests. But what matters to the Americans is to look at the Middle East not just as a place where our problems but as a place where the development of different processes of uh, energy, pandemics, uh, nutrition security, climate change, it's important for the American agenda and they do see the partnerships and the alliances as a possible central strategy for them. I don't think the Americans will be leaving the region, I don't think the Americans will be removing their forces from the area, but they will definitely not going to fight the battles of the regional countries. And in the end, the ramifications are in the eyes of the beholder, in fact. And um, I'm sorry to disappoint uh, Mr. Nasrallah. I don't think America is weak. And I think the American uh, conduct in um, war of Russia uh, against Ukraine expresses power and not weakness, but he can say it the way um, he was, obviously. I would like to say a word about Iran, uh, talking of um, American policy, by the way. Americans are emphasizing constantly that America will never allow Iran to obtain a nuclear bomb. I think I do think they mean it, but what is bomb in American eyes, from the other hand, in comparison to a uh, bomb in Israel, original eyes, and here the sense of threat of Iran in American eyes is very different from the sense of threat in the Israeli or local perspective. We can see the gap between the way the regional countries uh, conduct themselves with Iran and the way Israel conducts itself versus Iran. And I think that the Gulf countries, for example, understood that contact with Iran when America sees the threat differently has to be the way it is currently being managed through discussions with Iran and not through a conflict with Iran. Again, we need to take it into account. Mm -hmm. What, in fact, the agenda um, that the Americans present in the Middle East is quite clear. But it's less clear what is the agenda of the Chinese. What is going on with the Chinese in the area? For years and years, I hear about the very fact that the Chinese giant came to the Middle East and very soon it will be changing uh, everything uh, here. But we didn't see it actually happening. The experts claim that China is stalling from entering the Middle East to get involved in the unstable arenas because they don't have interest in those arenas, and the Middle East is definitely an unstable arena. And it seems that something, in fact, did change recently. We can actually see China more involved from an economical perspective, maybe even military, but mostly diplomatic. You mentioned here the Chinese mediation of the um, historic agreement between the Iranians and the Saudis, and even an um, offer to mediate between ourselves and the Palestinians to solve the crisis, and this was Chinese offer. Do they encroach deeper in the area, or is it just... Um, Pinpoint events. I want to say for a moment, I want to get back to the fact that the U.S. Uh, didn't market in a g good way its c conception of uh, the world and the change is taking place uh, is also towards Iran. But when we calculate in general the number of soldiers and the platforms. Uh, and the investment is in uh, the U.S. in the uh, Middle East. There's no uh, strange, uh, strong change. Mm -hmm. it domin it's dominant uh, opposite Daesh and Syria, and it continues to continue in all the regions mm -hmm. also by air and by sea, the special uh, uh, force that they have built to against the Iranians. And U.S. is very uh, uh, involved in the economy and the Middle East, and but at the same time, when we ask uh, in different countries in the they have a very low esteem of the U.S. and a very high esteem for Russia and China. And when you ask the the image of Israel, the U.S., uh, the image is that uh, the United States is leaving the region the because of declarations of uh, leaders of the uh, in the U.S. politics. And this narrative it has a significance, and this is, is what creates it, it. What we see, part of what we see here. The oil likes to uh, take uh, the risks, uh, the, the shortening the risk. The countries in the country and, uh, and they decided no, not to, uh, to to be on uh, the side of America because it's not so stable. So they are distributing the risks. 
uh, China wants at the end of the day to be a power, a superpower that uh, governs half of the uh, Eastern uh, globe in a very significant way. Uh, and it has uh, the uh, uh, plans for uh, the world force. The, the, the strategic, uh, uh, strategic world strategy is China, and they will solve this. Uh, that were good for the commerce. This is the idea of uh, China. This is its narrative. They only think about commerce in each place where they can find an opportunity to th that has a narrative that taking out the U.S. and enter the the region. What happened in Saudi between uh, Saudi and uh, Iran has started f four, three, two years ago, even more. It is started quite uh, far away. That they in the talk that they surprised us very much, and when they saw it, that is, uh, they gave the platform uh, and took this all, in and they will do it more and more. Each place where they can do an image that they can take out America and, and more influence of the China, they will enter to the Persian uh, Gulf and to the mid, uh, Middle East, uh, and for different uh, historical reasons also, this is a tragedy. So you had mentioned the wave of normalization we experienced in this area, including with those who were considered up to now as excluded from the milieu Bashar al-Assad um, that I follow quite closely. We see countries uh, actually normalizing relationship with this uh, war criminal Tunisia, Turkey and uh, Jordan, Saudis, which is a more dramatic event, the same historical agreement between the Saudis and the Iranians, the possibility of appeasement between the Yemenites and the Houthis, the warming up of relationship with the Gulf uh, countries after the Qatar crisis. Unprecedented. What is happening? How can you explain this unusual warming up? Is it just a result of the global understanding? Uh, is it the narrative that Amir just mentioned that one can't trust Americans or rely upon Americans and need to learn how to measure their own business on their own? There are so many different topics all together that are bundled up. There is a hedging on two levels. On the global level, we have here by the countries an attempt to diversify by two reasons. First of all, the can't receive certain things from the Americans and try to find it elsewhere, whether it's diplomacy or weapons. And it's an attempt to pressure the Americans to be a better ally. Those countries, mostly in the Gulf, um, uh, the rest of the Arabic space is a failing space of failing states, most of them. It uh, feels much more uh, of an asset. They feel that the higher level of assets on the background of the Ukrainian war is increased and they try to generate in eyes of the Americans a different equation of relationship where they have more value. I'd like to talk about the detente. First of all, those who are surprised by the detente and actually brought here a head of one of the newspapers and there were others and other reporters. The new Middle East that is new but dangerous. This is one of the headers of um, Israel newspaper. If you're surprised by what is happening in this area by this detente, you probably haven't been in the Middle East for two or three last years. We do monitor here in this institute and do write about that for two or three years. The process started a long time ago, and part of those um, buds uh, matured uh, recently. This process started in 2019 in Iran and Saudi case in 2018 with the opening of the embassy in Syria. And they also cry out that the Middle East became more dangerous. I would also disagree here. I think there's so many opportunities that are opening up for Israel as well. And we'll say that this whole leverage of various appeasements and arrangements in the Middle East between Tunisia, Syria, Bahrain, Qatar, that was very problematic by them in the past. The Emirates and Qatar will be reopening the embassies and you, Egypt and Turkey, continue very gradually to get close and a very dramatic, the end of war, I hope it's the end of the war and during the last eight years in Yemen. Those process in the center, which is not just the data within the Arabic space, not just the Arabic countries improve their own relationship, but the non-Arabic countries in the Middle East, such as Iran and Turkey, start to reinforce the relationship with the Arabic space. This is much bigger, actually, and more significant. I would like to emphasize as well that this uh, appeasement 
is not uh, based on love. It's not an appeasement based on religious or ideological uh, foundations. They're not dancing together, the Sunna and the Shia. The detente is a result of the necessity Iran and the Saudis start to understand and others. This is a deep need that they have in order to improve the current state of affairs for their own different reasons. Arabic countries uh, uh, want to put aside the decades of battles and struggles. We called it the Arabic Spring. It started then on different arenas with um, outbursts. They do choose dialogue um, in order to promote national goals. What brings them to this point? And this is the most interesting part. Why those countries choose a dialogue instead of a conflict? Three main reasons. First of all, within those countries, the internal level, there is a certain intent and a will among those poor countries to reinforce rehabilitate the economy turkey egypt or other poor countries in the middle east among the rich countries in the gulf there is also an intent to focus on the internal affairs but there this is an intent to bring to the maturity of different uh, projects some of the very megalomaniac projects neom and other projects and um, initiatives that are important for the prosperity of those countries so the internal need the reinforcement of iran and the encroachment of iran and their space and the nuclear threshold of iran brings to the process that did not start today some of the neighbors of iran want to get closer to their enemies uh, keep your enemies as close to yourself as possible while understanding that the power of iran is preferable and maybe the regional or international steps to stop Iran were exhausted at that point. The Gulf countries understand, I think, at that point uh, that Iran and Israel will be clashing at a certain point within a month, within a year. They want to distance themselves as much as possible from this future clash between Israel and Iran, and they want to preserve themselves doing that through approachment to the Iranians. And Tamir, as you said before, the third matter is the process, while understanding the clear-cut rationale based on the main polar uh, battle there is a decrease of american attention yeah the forces remain but there is the less of attentiveness of the americans to the security problems of those countries as far as the countries see that and what they actually try to do is to improve on their own their own situation if it's only possible one comment uh, we are right now in the midst of the historical process that is tremendously significant it's difficult to describe that we call it the competition between the powers and between the, the new order in the world. And we are don't know, know where we are. They don't know how it will end and how it will look like. But it is possible that it will be a world with that has two poles, also uh, multiple uh, poles. Uh, but this uh, design uh, makes that we have uh, the uh, regional powers that want to create, uh, to represent their uh, regional interests in the competition between the different powers. And that was part of the competition with the, the, the immense potential of a regional uh, port that Israel is part of it and is uh, the United States is the main uh, uh, matchmaker. This is getting uh, less and less and this is a little uh, connected to the attention, the inner intention to have such a uh, power that, that Israel is dominant and the they have to do it to, uh, to sit opposite the Americans and this is the key and the second point is uh, this uh, region from the point of view of the climatic uh, crisis is a very big uh, issue it's not for China China not for Russia but it is for there this uh, climatic uh, crisis is not really an issue it's not a, in their agenda in their geopolitical agenda but for the United States for yes and for Israel it has the capacity and also this we don't invest enough attention and energy to bring it forward and, and to use this potential because our attention is elsewhere, uh, unfortunately. I want to finish. Thank you for the contribution. What I take from this discussion, the, the previous panel, So today the region speaks to like which is the military one of the escalation of military conflict. And the regional detente and appeasement diplomatic processes, so those are two languages of the region. Uh, Israel remains in the first realm of the first language of the military and security languages as a concept of threats. What would you actually, in one sentence, because unfortunately our time is running out, what would you recommend to the current government of Israel to do in order to preserve the strength, the status of Israel and the regional superpower to remain relevant to this diplomatic access you mentioned? One sentence, really. One So very briefly. The, the changes in the region 
and the opportunity and very briefly it's a lot to talk about the first of all the the the, uh, the lessening of the crisis uh, in the region is in Israel and we enter in each region in the, the strengthening of the uh, relationship between uh, the, uh, uh, Syria and Iran is it good uh, I think it's it's a positive the the disadvantages are uh, less than the advantages are. And the w end of the war in Yemen, which has uh, hurt uh, the morally and economically from all the point of view for seven uh, years in uh, in Saudi Arabia, is the end. And I hope it will finish. So it looks like it looks good. If this indeed takes place, Saudi uh, the Saudis are getting uh, stronger. This is an Israeli interest, yes, but not only that the Hamas is getting closer to Saudi. Uh, to the, is it good? Is it bad? Yeah, that Saudi will have more influence on the, the Hamas. The, uh, one more center, the, the more advantages than the disadvantages. There is a problem of the uh, ability of the Israeli ability to work in the region. The uh, countries, the Arab countries, are getting closer to Iran. It's not good for Israel. Uh, and the uh, progress in the normalization, because we can get in the end. Uh, is, uh, so it's a uh, threat to Israel, but first of all, Israel has to to assure that the crisis with Israel it becomes, with the United States doesn't become a rift, that it will not uh, get uh, stronger, that it will hurt the uh, uh, interest of Israel and will harm its uh, relationship with the U.S. in the long run. We have to preserve this relationship by first priority. We have to look at it uh, for to the concrete uh, level and the long-term uh, level. And here the responsibility is big for the government, but not only because bec because there are uh, proof that problems and issues have to be cleared between the Israel and the US, like the issue of the uh, Iranians and the uh, nuclear issue, and to keep this uh, relation, the intimate uh, dialogue is uh, dependent on the Take into account of Israel, what Israel uh, U.S. is saying. We have to take it into account. We are, we don't have to do a lot because the, the general uh, direction is uh, positive. We have to bring back our our strongness, is uh, stability and uh, strength, uh, strongness. It will be the image of the most uh, stable country in the uni in the Middle East and the strongest country in the Middle East. And there's no doubt about its. Uh, it's unity, it's the, uh, I, the um, uh, IDF uh, strength. This is what we have to long for. We can to do it. And this is a bit different. We can do it very quickly, quite quickly. We have brought on upon ourselves uh, this, uh, uh, this weakness. And, uh, and we have brought uh, upon us the, the weakening of the image of the IDF. And if you decide tomorrow, if we decide tomorrow, it will come back because we have the ability to rehabilitate very, very quickly, and it's crazy how we can do it. We have to justify, to stop, uh, to continue, to hurt our own uh, scars, and to have to stop that. Thank you for the important uh, contributions. We're uh, going to the third panel about the uh, uh, social uh, crisis in Israel. So we will be moving to So um yeah uh okay so Tamir just um ended with um yeah we are in the air so Tamir just ended with this um uh, the beginning of our panel, because we'll be talking about the internal arena, of course, and Manu did open with um, and presented um, a call, a various uh, changes we're going through. And uh, I think the very fact that there are rifts in Israeli society and tension and friction, there's nothing new about that. We have the very famous uh, speech on the tribes of uh, President Rivling. I remember that the annual assessment on the internal arena was in charge of the chapter that talks about the tension between the democratic and the Jewish state and the national values and religious values and uh, democratic and liberal values. And um, 
what is the future holds for us and then in the institute we did publish the existential threats of the state of israel so there were the iranian threat and uh, precision gadget weapons and etc and i was recharged of the internal uh, threats again about them rifts even the civil war scenario that was uh, there at the low probability but um, obviously as we said uh, we know that the problem exists but we're not really sure we see that during the least last years we see an outbreak of all of those concerns and the threats that we thought will be quite distant they all look uh, a little bit more tangible in fact and uh, threatening and uh, close and we'll talk about that during this panel so again this whole audience already knows what we're talking about it does start with the government that was elected that is a full right-wing government with Benny Netanyahu as the left uh, uh, wing as symbol which was already then quite concerning but already had the governments from different directions and uh, there's a little bit of an undermining of the whole concept. The moment the government is being elected, it will be actually uh, preoccupying itself with the concerns of the whole nation, but not just those who voted for them, their constituents. Um, I think the next move of the government of uh, the charging with full throttle and full force upon the um, move of the judiciary overhaul that began from the place of criticism upon the uh, too high level of the judiciary activism and the appointment of the justices by recommendation of other judges, criticism that at a certain point one can actually see is not completely outrageous. Significant part of this criticism is irrelevant and the ignoring changes that already occurred, but then certain criticism in the field of security where this court actually facilitates and actually helps uh, the security forces. But this particular aspect of judicial criticism the solution that was suggested um, was uh, to amend the lack of balance that they claimed exists while creating a complete disbalance towards the other um, direction when all the power is in the hands of the government to appoint the judges and to restrict the ability of the court to restrict the government while well, we know that the parliament has no ability to restrict the government in fact so there was a bit of a concern that emerged that brought people to the streets um, we're concerned for the future of the democratic regime, whether we'll find ourselves in this situation where we won't be able to ex replace this government. That's what draw people to the streets. But we see a shift that brings me back to the beginning of what I just said. Suddenly it brought up all the reefs. When you look at this government with a certain very high level of concerns, what it actually represents, the coalition agreements and various statements concerning the future of our society as a liberal society, and where are the values and the check and balances. At the background of this particular concern, we all familiar with the significant level of protests, and the protest continues and carries on and does not erode. There are different attempts of reaching a compromise, the question where will it lead? And on this particular background, we are trying in this panel to address two stages, in two stages. What exactly is happening here? To what, what are the dangers of the current state of affairs? Some of them were addressed in the previous panels, but we were talking inwards. And secondly, and hopefully we'll hear from the panelist members whether we can emerge from this crisis and how. We will begin with the political arena, and here we have the expert, the senior researcher of this, the former parliament member of Ashalak that for years were the parliament uh, leading parliament member. And the question to you, sir, is a very simple one. Actually, a simple question to you, sir. First of all, what is behind this particular chapter following the continuation of the overhaul and the parliament and the budgetary discussions versus the promotion of the overhaul? What is happening? What will happen? around the negotiations at the president, and to what extent the opposition is connected to influence the protest, how in fact the status when there will be a compromise, maybe there will be some kind of uh, compromise. And before you do that, say a word about what might happen now during the next few days of the Memorial Day and the Independence Day. Will it impact um, somehow what is happening right now? The problem is uh, that the questions are raised. I don't know what will happen in the following days. Uh, I don't, we all know we, where it comes from. Uh, by me, by the I don't think that uh, that it only comes out uh, only now. That the uh, service, uh, the military service, uh, or the morning is a card that is uh, on this uh, identity uh, discussion. Is that from today? It's not from last years. 
it has been for a long time in the here but uh, as it happened with the military survey with the uh, threat of the uh, reserve not to get to the reserve uh, and uh, to make happen with uh, the uh, obligatory uh, recruitment uh, that would happen w with the laws of the recruitment of soldiers we got to a point that we from the point that uh, that the uh, stone took over this Pandora uh, box was open and the devils came out. All the devils come out and uh, now this thing, this uh, this issue also what was considered uh, like uh, basic ideals and, and uh, sacred uh, values uh, like the morning or the military service of the Israeli society which are a, very, a value uh, uh, issue and it's outside that we cannot put it into back into the box. Some other things that happened uh, lately. It's hard. It is hard for those among us uh, who for down with this member state is personally important, and of course for those who have lost uh, that the con uh, inf uh, that we both of that we think that it uh, should have been out of any dispute, but it is irreversible. If they will. If we'll succeed to survive that peacefully, will it help us to calm down? I'm not sure what peaceful means. I don't know what they're going to peace with it. So the two ministers have uh, said that they will not come to the uh, cemeteries uh, from the Yadut Torah with a religious party. The uh, problem is that, uh, by the way, it is clear. We were representatives of the country on those days uh, when we were members of the Knesset. When a representative of the country state is arrived, uh, that people who think this way or that way, they own this in the cemetery. And of course, for that, for them, these people, the, the presence of certain ministers is unbearable. And for other, the, 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 these people out there is uh, unbearable. And this is outside. This is here. This is on the table. We cannot return from that. There's no way to get back. I don't think that. Uh, and I want to take it to uh, to the, the general level. The political uh, system is irrelevant and had not been born today. It is uh, irrelevant. It happens all over the world in, in different countries. I think the political uh, systems are less less um, are, are, uh, um, able to to confront with the problems that people are dealing with, but we'll leave it as a general uh, remark. And the political uh, system is uh, trying to uh, run after the uh, tail that what's happening out there. Uh, mainly in the opposition, I think that that will happen. And I am in contact with people who are discussing this issue. There is nothing that will get to in the president how that will uh, calm down their protest. Uh, so the chance is very minimal to get to a compromise. If you want to say, I want to explain what can we get to, but I am saying that the the, uh, the uh, achievement, the maximum achievement that can we expect from the government and the coalition in this situation is that uh, they will now go back and the two neutralize the uh, two components that were the most central that made the protest effective let's uh, admit this is not uh, 150,000 people it doesn't matter how many people are going to the streets this uh, they gave a legitimation for two things that have never taken been so strong in the security and the economical uh, issues that bring to the end uh, the stopping of the uh, legislation and has uh, touched upon uh, not only on the story of Gallant, uh, but the very strong uh, strong uh, threats that the uh, security is in danger. He didn't say that they against the uh, uh, legislation that was the uh, reform, but the very, uh, that, uh, that the uh, leaders of the security in Israel have t told them about this uh, threat. W and uh, the damage, the economical damage, unfortunately, 
the government didn't do anything to uh, amend it, and we get uh, data that we get out to today. That, but the statements are very, very clear, and the signs of that the money is escaping from the c countries that are the uh, uh, companies that are registering the country, and the investment that are lessening. I think the maximal achievement that we can expect from the point of the government of all of them uh, that the. Uh, it that the uh, different entities, the different factors, after day one, uh, after the uh, Garland was uh, uh, resigned, was uh, was uh, taken out of his office, uh, the uh, Istadrut, the uh, has uh, given a general strike. They will not uh, calm down the protestation, but the protestation something very strong and deep that it. it and it's not governed by anybody, and not uh, not only the f falling down of the government, but the, the, the uh, basic change of the Israel, a fundamental change of the Israeli society. Can call it uh, uh, um, maybe a different positioning of the different political factors, and this will not, not stop. And there is no. I understand what Tamir said. I uh, accept his. Uh, it's not only the inner uh, uh, problem. I don't take, uh, but Israel can uh, challenge every challenge. But the situation is that there is no uh, leadership, political leadership is, is c close to a uh, discourse that stopped that, and it will happen. What happened, happened, whatever happened. So let's continue with this, right? And let's move to you. He did, Doctor, he did. Frank Gittelman is senior researcher in the Institute. You researched for many years the topic of society and the military. Let's talk about the threat that offer mentioned of the falling apart of various security services, such as an IDF as well. How would you assess to what extent really this falling apart, the threat of falling apart is actually tangible? What can prevent it? So I would take a risk and I will argue with offer, which is something I usually try to avoid. And, um, I think that, in fact, everything that will emerge from the president's dialogue, we can say that the process has a certain sentiment that will go for at least of the removal of the government. But I think that the forces that aid them significantly, the protests of the reservists, for example, uh, they will not be siding with such a purpose and without the reservist protest. It's quite interesting to see what will be the impact of the protest. I don't think it will be actually of the same scope that it existed before the overhaul stopped. If there will be any kind of consent reach, um, I have no any. Obviously, I will not argue with that, but um, no, this is not the question. Well, when we talk about the impact in the military, again, we need to distinguish between two different types of impact. There is a direct impact that as often said obviously and that would cause the, all of those warnings of the foreign part of the military and the protest um just one second we have a technical difficulty with the internet and the scope of the protest um wherever it touches the capacity of the idf to handle the threats um, the um, threat of the reservists and the whole preoccupation that is provoked and required from the heads of the um, system. And if you remember, the previous panels mentioned that in all of the arenas, significant level of attention has been um, addressed to this particular aspect. But there is also a lateral impact and a more dangerous one, which is actually the dragging of the military into the political space. And it doesn't matter how the military will be conducting itself within this space. The price tag will be tremendous. And we talked about rifts and the direct impact. I think it's even more than um, how the IDF will be handling the lack of reservists arriving to the drills. The sentiments of the first Israel and the second Israel rift that is currently emerging while uh, taking the military hostage into this political space, I think it uh, created even more problems for the military than the very fact of the refusal of reservists. That was maybe even imaginary one. Let's talk about the protest of the pilots. This imaginary tension between the technical assistant uh, department and the pilots. Someone wanted to emphasize this pro problem that did not exist. And now the reservists return to serve at reservist duty. All the previous panels talk about the ability to handle the attacks. Obviously, in advance, they said that for the operational activity, they will be arriving. But this problem has been solved. But the tension and the gaps, um, the sense of discomfort between the different parties in the military remained. 
Now, when we look at the military into political space in the world, we would never imagine the realms of the Division 51, there was um, um, discipline events that happened many before the protests and many will happen in the continuation. Ten minutes went by before they published the event and then social networks were um, someone received the refusal among the pilots. Now they're seeing the refusal of the Gulani Brigade. Okay, obviously, as the commanders of the military, what are we going to do with the disciplinary action? Whatever they will be doing, they will be politically biased. Whether it will be a harsh treatment, you can see the pilots, we contain them, but the Gulani soldiers are being hardly disciplined. And the blue containing what actually happened. Look at that, uh, and all the social networks were actually bubbling. Well, this is too light of the punishment, and look at the pilots, this is because of them. Again, one can understand what the motivation of those different agencies to do that, but one cannot really exaggerate to what extent this is a dangerous tendency for the military, I think more than some kind of immediate ramifications. So basically, uh, Ariel Iman, who is the PhD and the Brigadier General, and the senior researcher, he was also the chief reservist officer in the past, Maybe a little bit, let's get into the topic for reserve service. And later on, I would love to hear about the rest of the forces of security, such as police and etc. Reservist force, to what extent are you afraid that the compromise in the presidential dialogue will decrease this threat, or is it already irrelevant? To what extent, in fact, the threat is actually real, or is it just completely exaggerated in comparison to the actual occurrences? What has been said? Both have been said. And, uh, it is really was uh, uh, realized. No. Uh, I don't There was a short uh, uh, test. In addition to that, uh, briefly, uh, the uh, reserve is a small test. It really it withstood the, uh, but the protest didn't stop. That uh, and the reserve uh, soldiers uh, still uh, erupted. But uh, what, what I know, what I hear. No, <laughs> And if uh, there will be a legislation in a, it will be difficult to uh, take place of event. A very good uh, 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 leader in court, but he left of a big expert in the uh, in social issues in the within the Israeli society. The uh, 
uh, political uh, playground uh, made a mistake and it uh, lessens its uh, problem to uh, as of I said uh, 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 there is a very strong uh, devil that would somehow with silence in, in the bottle uh, an informal uh, agreement uh, came out uh, burst out uh, big and it will create an uh, immense protest so let's talk uh, so let's talk a little bit about the um, recruitment law because the ultra orthodox are not being drafted well, whether it's uh, audacity or not, but if you want to solve and to legislate on this matter of the recruitment law, of the draft, do you think that the law on the draft will create uh, a crisis? What's your opinion about the draft law? How can we actually solve this problem, to your opinion? I mean, my eyes, if an operative, what uh, has to be the two things only. The one thing some kind of uh, a definition the coalition will not have a majority in choosing the judges so for that purpose uh, go, go back uh, when we all get the justice uh, that the, uh, the uh, but uh, retreating at this point from uh, all the uh, legislation that they wanted to do but uh, and for the judges, uh, the different uh, uh, proposal, you know even better than I do, but whatever will happen, but the anti-public uh, uh, is, if the coalition can uh, 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 put judges by its own uh, uh, decision, and next to it is the uh, enrollment of soldiers. There has to be a law for the enrollment of soldiers, otherwise uh, we, we are in uh, trouble. But uh, uh, and uh, this uh, law has to be such that and there are different proposals of the table, the proposal of uh, of Lieberman or the, in my opinion, is not a good one. This uh, very bad uh, proposal because the the you know the law that we have put on the table in the point of view of the alternative service to the military service that will solve other problems, but also in the model that uh, we've been uh, suggested by the IDF that we support to making the service shorter and the differential uh, military service, they put it... Uh, שומעים כלום.
received it. Received it. So, as we said during the previous panels, what one has to do, what has to be done today in order for us to create some kind of an exit from this crisis, in order to return uh, to into our balance that is more convenient that existed here before. What we need to do in order to reach some kind of chance of exiting from this crisis. So first of all, I would like to say that the way the protest is the has never been actually led by some kind of uh, force. If there is a chance or any hope um, of the young generation, in fact, I think we need to listen to what which is Orna just said. I completely agree. We are here in order to create a new social contract. I don't have, um, obviously, high expectations from the current government, but I do think that what we do not talk about right now and we need to see what we do in a context. So this law, the conscription law, and the increase of uh, the um, pensions paid to the Swiss Auditorium, obviously until now they persuaded us that exempting them from service, they will be joining the employment market, but it's not happening, and that's why the protest is not coming down. Again, we aspire towards the equality, and um, we can't accept such a situation. Okay, again. And we need to maybe give an advice, and it's very convenient for me to talk about the military. The military has to understand that it's a civic process. They speak a different language, and they need to conduct themselves in a way that is... Just a second. So when it comes to the external threats, uh, the military knows how to do that. But how you conduct yourself in the world that is almost completely civic, and uh, you have to know that the rules of the game are different. Ariel. I will use one word that may be a bit of a way out to describe the current state of affairs for all of the parties, and this is governance try to, and it's very difficult to do that, because indeed some of the protesters say, you know what, all the rules were completely broken and we will never give you up until we'll rearrange a new, reach a new order. They have to understand that there are the things that are currently on the agenda, for example, the security situation of Israel, and they have to be very uh, government-oriented. The government has to understand that in some places they need to be very statehood-oriented. A joint letter, which is a sign of it, the joint letter of Netanyahu with the others for the uh, Remembrance Day. So statehoodness is something we need to look for. People of that represent the protests, soldiers in the military, the IDF has to understand they need to be statehood spirit oriented to avoid entering the British arena at any cost that will preserve the situation will manage to bring us to the purified moment of some kind of capability of agreeing with something offer do you believe that there is such a chance of reaching the statehoodness frankly not really to reach it not to go back so you know frankly look at that in my eyes a significant part of uh, my solution here is to look into the eyes of the problem and to figure out what is happening. And what actually happened here is, in fact, and I talked about uh, the demons that were, the genies that emerged from the bottle, and they were being accumulated in this bottle for many years, not just by the government and the judiciary overhaul. Those demons were in the bottle, and that was an act, I don't even know how to define that, whether it's an act of um, stupidity or evil or or blindness, whatever you want to call it, of the lifting the lid of this bottle, but the demons were inside of it. Uh, I don't know, maybe, again, I do hope that people, and um, it did mention the younger generation. I don't see significant involvement of the younger generation, what is happening right now. Well, they are those who are dancing at Copland Street. This is not an involvement of young generation, what is happening right now. I don't see different language that is happening. 
my body will emerge from there. And maybe we'll be, get scared a little bit, and that's what will birth the change. And there will be an uh, actually quite panic discord around our existence, but it will cause the discord, and we'll understand that we're actually looking into the abyss, and uh, we need to go back from the brink of this abyss. Tell you, can I tell you that I know how will it happen? No, again, I would like to go back to the point. Um, you do see that the general agenda of uh, dialogue at the president's, uh, well, there is a certain um, faction, and I'm always mentioning that when I talk to people that are within this dialogue, people from outside, they are really halved. They want to get to some kind of decisive decision they own with their agenda, but there is an aspiration to what things to become normal again. So we need people that... Uh, uh, within the room, within the political system, need to overcome this particular situation. Are they capable of that? Well, I will say it this way. I am not a prophet. Well, before we finish, by the way, we didn't talk about the economical situation. We didn't mention the Arabic world, the Arab population in Israel, 20% of the state of Israel population, which is also part of this narrative. And the police, we will mention that. We did touch just the tip, tip of the iceberg of the channel crisis, but I will try to actually round it up. Hopefully, I will not sound too naive. But as someone who actually is um, um, someone who is alone of the peace talks, and I met people with different opinions from the right wing map and the religious one. I'm a secular person, but again, we met as well in the president's house and uh, discussing various uh, peaceful conversation processes. There's a bit of a demonization of both parties of the other side of the rival. And uh, I think that there is a complete lack of trust, not just in the political rank, but it's also a lack of trust in everything but who thinks differently from you. And I think maybe some kind of beginning among the younger generation, maybe adults, but again, maybe it's a little bit of uh, agreement to listen and a willingness to listen, not to attribute uh, some kind of evil intentions to those who think differently. Maybe we all will start from this particular point and maybe we can emerge from this crisis or maybe not. Uh, yeah, but we do hope that will go through. The Remembrance Day and the Day of Independence said peace and people will, uh, I just said, with internal and um, power, inbound and outbound, so we can unite as much as possible inwards, but also handle the external threats. So thank you, those of you who were listening and watched. Thank you for participation.